Hi everyone, it's Beth here from the Bumps Baby chapter. I'm really sorry to have missed on my talk uh, today, Saturday, um, with you. I unfortunately had a positive lateral flow um, before I left for the baby show yesterday. So I am doing this. Uh, via video but the good thing is for you guys it means that you still get access to all this information but you also get to watch it as many times as you need so that is the silver lining um, for you so my talk is on how to stack the odds in your favor for successful breastfeeding so firstly I want to say that some women the baby is born, uh, the baby latches on, they've done nothing um, to stack the odds in their favour. It's just one of those things. Some babies just latch on and it's very, very easy. Whereas other women do everything uh, to stack the odds in their favour, um, but still find breastfeeding challenging. So the points I'm going to talk to you about today will hopefully make breastfeeding a little bit easier for you to navigate. Breastfeeding is a little bit like birth in that you can do things to influence it, but just like birth, there are things that can happen um, that we can't control and we just have to navigate them in the best way as possible. So some factors that can affect breastfeeding are things like how your birth went, uh, things like tongue tie, uh, your milk supply as well. So some women naturally have a milk supply that can feed the whole nursery, um, whereas some women have enough uh, to just feed their feed their babies, which is obviously um, still enough. Um, and then a very, very small percentage of women uh, produce less um, than what their baby needs, but this accounts for a very, very small percentage. So the five things that I'm going to talk to you about is number one, your birth and breastfeeding. Number two is feeding on demand. Number three is your position in breastfeeding. Four, hand expression. And five, making a postnatal plan. So these are all the things that I think will help stack the odds in your favour for a successful breastfeeding journey. Okay, so starting with number one, your birth and breastfeeding. So your birth does have an implication on your breastfeeding experience. So often, if a woman has a more traumatic birth, your adrenaline uh, is higher, your oxytocin is lower. And what we need for breastfeeding and what we need for your body to it's called the letdown reflex. It's where your body let goes of the milk or the colostrum. Um, for that to happen, oxytocin is the key hormone in that. So having high levels of oxytocin can really help our bodies in releasing that colostrum or breast milk. So if you've had a more traumatic birth experience, this can mean that you have lower levels of oxytocin compared to if you have a birth that goes exactly how you wanted it, or you feel felt calm throughout, for example, and when your baby is born, um, the baby comes straight up onto your skin, for skin to skin, these are things that are going to increase your oxytocin. So I don't want you sitting there thinking, well, I, you know, I, I'm already nervous about what my birth's going to be like or what happens if I do have a, a traumatic birth or a birth that doesn't go the way that, that I wanted it to go. So this is what I want to focus on more um, in this section because actually if, you, if your birth goes fairly straightforward, then often that time after birth as well is also very straightforward. The midwives suggest that you have skin to skin and the midwives come um, <laughs> the midwife doesn't come onto your chest. <laughs> your baby comes onto your chest and often stays there uh, for you know an hour um, or however long that you you want your baby in skin to skin. Um, 
so that's if your birth goes very straightforward. If your birth doesn't go straightforward, so maybe you are feeling um, very shaky after birth, maybe your baby needs to go to special care. And um, these are things that can interrupt that skin to skin. So uh, firstly then, um, so sometimes after a cesarean um, or after a more traumatic birth, uh, women can feel very um, shaky and sometimes don't want to have their baby in skin to skin straight away. And whilst I would say to you that that's fine if you don't feel like you want to have your baby in skin to skin, um, but if you can, I would really encourage you to put baby on your skin anyway, and then maybe ask your partner to stand over you and protect baby. If you're feeling shaky, often women don't want to have their babies on skin to skin because they're worried that they won't be able to hold or support their baby. But often I find that women who are shaky when they have their babies on them skin to skin it actually reduces that shakiness anyway so shakiness after birth can be caused by a rush of adrenaline and having your baby in skin to skin can reduce that adrenaline and increase your oxytocin so not only does is it beneficial for baby and breastfeeding? It's actually beneficial for you too as a mum and feeling bonded with your baby. So if you don't feel up to it, but you want, you want still want to do it, like if it's in your plan, if it's in your um, birth plan, then ask your partner at that time to encourage you to do it and just support you doing it. If, for example, your baby is in special care or you need treatment immediately after birth, then don't feel bad, don't feel guilty or bad or um, worried that you haven't had that immediate skin to skin straight away. Because actually the beauty of skin to skin is that you can do it anytime. So I would, I would still be recommending you doing it when your baby is two, three, four weeks old. So, think about instead of thinking about that immediate time after if you can't have that just have it as soon as it is possible for you and baby so that might be when you go to special care to see baby um, you can ask the special care nurses to help get baby out and put baby onto your skin um, or if um, for example you need to go to theatre uh, then you, when you get back from theatre, ask the midwives, um, ask, ask your partner to help get baby onto your skin um, straight away. And these are all things that you can write on your birth preferences or your birth plan, whatever you're choosing to call it. So you can say that you want uh, um, skin to skin immediately um, or as soon as it is possible. So when that time comes uh, for you to do skin to skin, uh, so either immediately after baby's born or a little bit later uh, if, um, you know, your health needed it to happen a little bit later, um, uh, think about ways that you can increase your oxytocin in your body. So obviously the, the big one that I've said is uh, skin to skin. Um, but there are some other things that you can do as well to help increase your oxytocin. So having that skin to skin uninterrupted um, is, is a great thing. So you could ask your midwife, you could say, can any procedures that need to be happen to baby? So for example, if your baby needs to have its heart rate listened to or its temperature done, um, you can ask your midwife, you can say, can, do you mind doing that whilst baby's still on, still on my skin? Um, there is no rush to get baby dressed so you can go to if you're moving from um, say for example a delivery suite to a ward um, and you do need to transfer you can still transfer if you wanted to you can still transfer baby on your skin so you would have baby on your skin on the bed and then you would have blankets uh, over you both as you move up to the ward um, whilst going going back a step, whilst you are um, within the room um, where you are having your skin to skin, you can have the lights a little bit lower. Um, if you had a birth playlist, you can have your birth playlist playing uh, calmly in the background, and you can ask for no interruptions. You can you can say to your midwife at this time, um, please you know please can you give us a bit of time at this moment. Um, for us to bond with our baby 
And actually often that happens anyway. As a midwife, I, I spend a good hour doing my notes anyway. So often that's a time where your midwife can go and do your notes and then you both can have that uninterrupted skin to skin uh, bonding time with your baby. So that was the first thing that I wanted to talk to you about, the golden hour. And I, I really do want to highlight that that golden hour can happen at any time. So it doesn't happen doesn't have to happen immediately after birth. You can do it when you are up on the ward. You can do it even when you're back from the hospital. Pick a time where you think, I'm going to really kind of nourish my oxytocin here. So if you have had a more traumatic birth, I don't want you to feel like you can't have this, that you can't have this time. It is a very important thing for breastfeeding because of that increase of oxytocin. And thinking about the oxytocin and the key role that it plays that's just that's not just important for that one time after birth think about these key factors and key elements at any point in your breastfeeding journey so for example a couple of weeks down the line maybe you're feeling a bit stressed and you're thinking why is my why is my milk not coming out so that can happen because of that increase of adrenaline pumping on pressure so personally, my own personal experiences, I remember pumping an hour before I had to leave for work and I'm there thinking, why is my milk not coming out? Why is my milk not coming out? But it's purely just because my adrenaline is higher than my oxytocin. So you can apply these things that we've learned about birth and how birth and, and oxytocin affects your breastfeeding experience. You can apply that throughout your whole breastfeeding journey. So the second thing that I wanted to talk to you about was feeding on demand. So I'm sure you've all heard that expression before. Uh, so when you have a baby, you initially are feeding your baby on demand. So the reason why this is encouraged um, is for a couple of reasons. So the first reason is because your baby's tummy is teeny tiny. So uh, a day old baby, the tummy is the size of a marble. It's really, really small. Um, when you get up to a, um, a baby that's around day three, uh, the ball increases to about the size of a ping pong ball. So it does increase quite quickly, um, but you can see why babies want to feed uh, so frequently in those early days um, is because their, their tummies are so small. Um, Although saying that, I will day the, the first 24 hours, babies are often notoriously uh, a little bit quieter or a little bit sleepier and they may feed only three to four times. But I will talk about that later on. Um, but after that, they, they do feed very, very frequently. But also your for your milk supply as well. So if your breasts will work on a supply and demand, so the more your baby is telling your body by latching on that uh, he or she is demanding milk, the more your body is going to produce. So if you structure your feeding, for example, to every three hours or every four hours, then your milk supply is, is, is going to be less from that. So feed on demand. And if you think about how you feed, um, in a day so think about over the last 24 hours how much how many times did you take a sip of water uh, how many times um did well what meals did you have did you have breakfast lunch and dinner then did you have um a little snack after your dinner did you have like a pudding um was one of your meals a starter main course <laughs> and uh pudding did you then have a cup of tea after uh did you wake up and have uh an orange juice or a cup of coffee and then a, a croissant and then an hour later have a bit of yogurt so we don't feed on the, on the schedule so a term healthy baby uh, will also not feed like that as well. So that's what we've got to be aware of. So when your baby is um, showing signs of rooting um, and you think, but I've only fed my baby half an hour ago or an hour ago, um, that's still fine. That's okay that your baby then wants to go back onto the breast. 
Um, so that's a really, really important thing to remember. So feed your baby on demand. So um, what are the cues for um, for feeding? How do you know that your baby wants to, wants to feed? So babies tend to uh, do something called rooting. So it's where they uh, open their mouths and they're looking around for a breast. If uh, your partner is holding them at this time, then they may try and latch onto their arm. If you've got them by your face, they'll go for your chin or your cheek and they'll just root around, rummage around um, as they look for a breast. Uh, the signs as well is a pout or they start smacking their lips together as well. So these are all signs. Um, they can bring their, it's like they're crawling. They can start doing these wild things with their hands and then eventually you start putting their hands inside their mouth as well. So if you catch baby at this time, so if this is something that baby is starting to do, this is a better time to feed baby rather than waiting for baby to cry. So a lot of people say, oh, don't worry, baby will, baby will let you know when they want to feed. Um, and what people mean by that is baby will be crying. Baby will cry if they want to feed. But actually that can make breastfeeding more challenging because when a baby is crying, they stick their tongue um, to the top of their mouths. Like that's what they do when they cry, don't they? They're uh, mouth wide open and tongues at the back. But you want to get your nipple and your breast tissue over the top of that tongue. So what you then find that you might need to do is calm baby down before you latch baby on, which can make it a little bit more tricky. So if you can try and catch baby at those feeding cues, um, then that will work to your advantage. It doesn't always work as simple as that. So sometimes baby will be crying. Um, and I don't want you to feel like it's because you've missed a feeding cue. It's inevitable that at some point in your baby's life, you will have to settle your baby before, before you feed baby. And I don't want you to think that that's because you've missed feeding cues. Um, but it is something to be aware of. So if you see your baby trying to do these feeding cues, uh, then that's the point where you want to, want to be thinking about uh, getting baby into skin to skin or um, you know starting to feed your baby. Another thing to think about uh, is something called cluster feeding. So cluster feeding uh, notoriously happens at certain points in the baby's life. Uh, so usually night two is one of them. Um, and then uh, at about a week old, and then when they have their growth spurts, they are telling your body that they want more milk. Um, and I don't want you to think that your baby is, is starving. So often when babies are cluster feeding, they're on the breast all the time and mums start to think, oh, it's because I'm not giving my baby enough milk. I haven't got enough milk. And whilst um, it's not, whilst that's uh, it's true in the sense that baby is, is showing your body that it has a, de it needs a demand. It has a demand for more milk your baby is not starving hungry. So you're not starving your baby or your baby's not really, really hungry um, that it, it um, you know, that's why it's upset. It is just telling your body, I'm, I'm gonna have a growth spurt now, so I need more milk. And if we give babies top ups at this time, um, then that can then interfere with that supply and demand. So it may settle your baby, so you might, give your baby a top up because you're feeling like your baby is hungry. You give it a top up um, and then your baby settles. But that means for your milk supply that uh, your baby hasn't told your body all of that time um, that it needed the more milk. Um, so if possible, um, if, you're, if you are going through a period of cluster feeding, see it as a positive thing. This is how our bodies and how the relation, the, the feeding relationship between baby and um, mum works. Our babies will create a demand and then our supply will increase. So see it as a positive thing. It can be really, really tricky. And I would encourage you to have uh, little um, like boxes around your house in key areas um, to help with those cluster feedings. So you might want to have your um, a book to hand or your phone to hand charger. Water is a really really important thing because when baby 
um, because when baby latches on, it's like you instantly feel first. Um, so make sure you've got things like snacks, biscuits, um, bananas, a, 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 a flask full of water um, around you for those times where you're cluster feeding. Thinking then about uh, feeding your baby on demand. So what would you expect your baby to feed on the first 24 hours? So after babies have just been born, uh, a healthy term baby may only want to feed um, three to four times, and that's really normal. So uh, they have been on a journey as well. They have navigated your pelvis. They have been born into this big world and their bodies have suddenly got to readapt. They have to regulate their own temperatures, regulate their own sugars. They have to breathe by themselves. They have to do all of that, um, you know, immediately after they've been born. Um, so whilst doing things like skin to skin uh, really helps with all of that. So skin to skin will regulate a baby's temperature, regulate a baby's uh, breathing and heart rate. Um, but they do also feed, yeah, they tend to only feed like three to four times as a minimum. Equally, it is normal if your baby wants to feed more than that. So don't feel like you would be overfeeding if your baby is wanting more. Also, if you have a baby that is uh, less than 37 weeks, uh, is below 2.5 kilograms, or if you've had gestational, gestational diabetes, if you're type 1 diabetic, um, if you've had high blood pressure and you've had a, a tablet that reduces your blood pressure, so or um, some other things. So these things can all impact your baby's blood sugars after birth. In these situations, midwives and paediatricians would encourage you to feed your baby every three hours at a maximum. So if your baby, again, wants to feed after an hour, um, then that's fine. But we would advise you not to let baby feed, uh, not to let baby go longer than those three hours. Um, and that's because you'd be advised to have your blood sugars taken for baby. So baby's blood sugars would be taken. Um, and these babies are more uh, at risk of having a lower blood sugar, which is why you would be encouraged for these babies to feed your baby more than that minimum three to four times. So, um, after uh, the first 24 hours, your baby from that point will want to feed at a minimum of eight times in a 24 hour period. And that is the rule from 24 hours old uh, right up until uh, they are six months, unless you've been told differently um, by your own midwife or paediatrician. So usually the guide is between eight to 12 times in a 24 hour period, but we know that babies go through periods of cluster feeding where they can, you feel like they are on the breast all evening. Um, and these are short amount of times. Um, if you find that your baby is consistently feeding, over that 12 times, um, you know, every single day baby is, you know, feels like baby's always on the breast, then, then you would want to uh, get some breastfeeding support. So that was number two, um, feeding your baby on demand. Number three is a good positioning. So getting yourself in a good position for breastfeeding uh, can really help with baby's latch. Let's think about you and when you drink, when you pick up a cup of water or when you pick up a bottle of water, uh, what do you do? This is my cup of coffee. I've obviously done that exaggerated, but you get the idea. Um, I don't do this. I don't do this. And imagine drinking your coffee, having someone, having someone's hand on your head. When you're watching your baby and watching how your baby is going to latch on to your breast, think about how you would be drinking a, uh, a cup of coffee or a cup of water. So um, babies need to be in a line. So like me drinking my cup, 
uh, we we weren't doing this. So sometimes um, when people are feeding, they put their babies quite upright um, like this and then expect the baby to turn their head uh, to latch on to the breast. Uh, and this makes it hard for baby. Um, also, like this, this baby actually is quite like it anyway, but um, you can see that baby's chin is quite close to the chest. Um, so if you feel like your baby is trying to latch onto the breast by putting its chin to its chest, that's going to make it challenging for baby to have a good latch. So holding your baby by their shoulders, so making a, a V, and supporting your baby by uh, baby's shoulder blades will encourage baby to drop their head back. And just like I did without, uh, without drinking my coffee, I put my head back the same as you would drinking a bottle of water. Uh, we naturally tip our heads back and babies also want to do the same. So supporting baby here, so you're still supporting baby's head and neck by supporting them here, um, but you are allowing them to tip their heads back. And what this does as well is if, um, if you run your tongue, uh, from behind your teeth you'll feel like it's quite hard and then the further you get back it gets softer and there's a natural arch so you want your breast tissue and your nipple specifically to be that far back in baby's mouth so nipple damage um, can occur so cuts on your nipples sore nipples can occur if the latch is too shallow in baby's mouth so it's breastfeeding not nipple feeding you want to get a big chunk of breast tissue uh, into baby's mouth and often this is encouraged if babies are able to tilt their heads back they open their mouths really really wide and then they will latch on um, so it's a bit like a hungry hippo game have you ever played hungry hippos where they come out and the, the hungry hippo's mouths are really big and then they close it. If you don't, if the babies don't latch on um, properly at that time, so if they, if they don't latch on on that big mouth, then you've just like the hungry hippos, you've just got to start again. So sometimes it can be um, a case of um, pulling your baby slightly away from the breath. So uh, just in line um, around here, so above their lip, and then they will tilt back and then open their mouth and then the nipple goes into the mouth. So you wanna think uh, about roughly nose to nipple or if you want to rub your nipple onto the top of baby's lip as well, that also encourages them to tilt their head back. Big mouth, if they don't get the latch at that point, then start again. So even if, you f if they have latched when their mouths have been closed, or, or smaller, then it's always best to put your little finger into the corner of their mouths to break the latch. Sometimes what they can do is um, like suck in. So if they've got a smaller mouth when they're latching, they tend to suck in like, and then it sucks your nipple in. And obviously like I cringe at the thought of that and I've breastfed four babies. So it does, it makes you like, oh, doesn't it? The thought of um, a baby doing that to your nipple. So always think nice big mouth and holding your baby um, like this uh, can encourage your baby's latch uh, to be more effective. So you don't just have to do the cross cradle hold, uh, a rugby ball position as well. So you're literally holding your baby in the same position, um, but like a rugby ball. Uh, another position that I would really recommend uh, is lying down. Uh, so you would be lying down um, on your side. Your breast would be on the bed. Your shoulder would also be on the bed. And then you would have your arm then going around baby. And these positions are good because actually you don't have to be touching baby that much. Sometimes when we're trying to latch baby on, we can feel a little bit... Um, you know, we don't really know what to do and when to bring baby in and all of that. So feeding on your side takes all of that out because baby's already in the position. If you line your um, nipple up with baby's um, nose or just above, their, uh, just above their lip, then 
um, they can latch themselves on and, and we don't have to do much at all. Um, I say we as in you, <laughs> as mum. So that's positions uh, kind of around baby. Um, but think about your own position as well. So like the position of your body. If we're quite slouched, uh, that can make it hard uh, for baby to latch on as well. So you want to almost like sit yourself up, perky boobs, um, and and that can help like, kind of point your nipples up, um, which helps baby latch on. Um, that's one thing. If you're in a sat up position, um, sitting upright uh, is is helpful. Um, and in a cesarean, so after a cesarean, where you are naturally more slouchy, just purely because you've had a spinal anaesthetic, uh, the rugby ball hold is good, especially for those, um, or as well as for those uh, with large breasts as well. So if your breasts are, are large, um, then holding your baby in a rugby ball position uh is is again a, a, another really good one to, to do so if you're having a, a cesarean or you, if you have a cesarean or if you've got large breasts um think of this rugby hold as well uh, one other thing that i wanted to mention um, which is relatable to the second and the third point um is to do with preparing your nipples so we have mentioned you know, that baby is going to be feeding after the first 24 hours, baby is going to be feeding at a minimum of eight times. We've talked about cluster feeding, you know, we've talked about getting that latch right as well um, to prevent nipple trauma. Um, and lots of people, or the older generation especially, uh, talk about preparing your nipples. So I remember when I had my first kid at 19, uh, my dad's dad, so my ganker, um, I said to me, get a get a metal scourer on you on those nipples. And as a 19 year old, I was thinking, what? Why? Why? Why would I do that to my nipples? And I didn't. I didn't do that to my nipples. Luckily, my mum, um, you know, was very very switched on, and she was like, just don't don't listen to Ganka. Um, so that's a lot of things that that people say you know sandpaper them scour them all these really grim things um which i would i would say to definitely don't do so we don't have to prepare our nipples for breastfeeding what i would uh encourage you to do is get some um some lanolin cream so lanolin is the product it's the actual cream um the there's different brands ones so you might have heard of Lansano which is the purple um cream but the product is lanolin and you can get that across um many different um brands but you're looking for lanolin basically and you would only then put that onto your nipple if your nipple had a cut so the reason why our nipples um, can feel really sore once they're cracked is because every time you, if you have a cracked nipple, afterwards your nipple obviously um, scabs, you know, like, a, like any cut would, it starts to heal, starts to harden. And then in a few hours, you're putting your baby back on to that same cut. And so our nipple cuts are going um, hard, scabbing over and then baby's latching on and then they're breaking again and then they go hard and then they break again and and that can be really sore so what the lanolin cream does is keeps the wound soft there's a name for this i think the name is literally soft wound healing um i think that's right but basically the idea is is that you keep the wound you keep the cut um soft and um so you keep it soft uh, and that is how it heals so that's so much more comfortable um than it being um hardened and then, and then broken again um and if you do have trauma to your nipple so if you are having if you do have a cut on your nipple um then it's really important uh to have somebody check the latch so i'm sure you've all heard the people saying that breastfeeding shouldn't be painful and whilst there is some truth in that, um, it, it can be, I personally find it quite misleading. So 
uh, I think it's really important that if your breast feeding is causing you pain, then it's 100%, I would 100% recommend you have some support. So go to a support group um, to have somebody check the latch of baby um, and your positioning and give you some pointers. However, uh, when baby latches on first, it's a, it's a new feeling, it's a new experience and it can make, it's, it's, so, it's so different that it does, it does make your toes curl for a minute and then it settles. Um, so I fed four children, um, I have helped many women um, breastfeed um, at being a midwife and I would say that the majority of them have that initial um, toe curling. And also, if you have a cut on your nipple, it can then continue to feel painful. So you then may have nailed your latch, but you're thinking, well, why is this still painful? I must be getting it wrong. So whilst breastfeeding long term shouldn't be painful and it's always important to get checked out um, no matter where you feel pain during your breastfeeding journey for things like good latch, good positioning, thrush, mastitis. If all of those things are going well and you know none of those things are an issue, it could just be a case of time. So it could be that you either need to um, kind of get used to that sensation of breastfeeding or you have had previous a previous cut on your nipple um, that has is is still bothering you as baby's latching on, and that will obviously just need a, a little bit of time to heal. What I don't want people thinking is that if it's still a little bit uncomfortable, I don't want you sitting there thinking I'm doing something wrong. I must be doing something wrong because it's still hurting me. It's, it's still hurting, um, and I don't want that to be a reason for you to quit breastfeeding because you feel like you're doing something wrong so it's definitely important to get checked um, but sometimes it can just be a little bit of time so that was number three uh, number four is hand expression so this is one thing that you can do in pregnancy to stack the odds in your favor for breastfeeding so um Hand expression isn't an essential thing to do. If you don't do hand expression, it doesn't mean that your baby's not going to have colostrum in those early days. Your body is going to produce that colostrum. So why do we encourage women to do hand expression? So for, for some women, we encourage it more than others. Um, so for example, if you have had one of those um, things that I spoke about earlier to do with low blood sugars, so gestational diabetes, if you've been on high blood pressure uh, medication, if you're predicted to have a premature baby or a uh, low birth weight baby. So anything that means that your baby may struggle with his or her blood sugars in the early days, I would encourage you to do hand expression of colostrum. It just means that uh, if, for example, you have that baby on the breast, um, and baby's blood sugars are still on the lower side, you can latch baby on the breast again, but you can also latch baby on the breast and then give that extra boost of colostrum. It also means that if you have had um, maybe a, a traumatic birth or your baby's gone to special care, you've already got a good stash of colostrum syringes. So you still will need, if your baby isn't latching after birth, you will still need to hand express. So I don't want you thinking that just because you've expressed antenatally, you then don't need to do it if your baby needs the syringes after. Because you want to still be showing your body that there is a demand for colostrum. So if your baby is reluctant to latch or uh, in special care and you've got the syringes, you will still be expressing more. Uh, whilst your baby is having those antenatal syringes. So this is why we say it's not, not entirely necessary because you, you, you still need to do it. However, if for example, uh, maybe your blood, less, blood loss has been higher or you're having a high level of adrenaline and a low level of oxytocin, and when you're hand expressing, um, maybe you're only getting small amounts of colostrum, those situations, it means that you're still encouraging your breasts to produce milk because you're still stimulating them, 
but during the time that you aren't producing enough for what baby needs at that moment, you have colostrum as a backup already prepared for in pregnancy. So you can see why it's more important for women who whose babies may have low blood sugars, but if giving your baby formula or giving your baby a top up is something that you really don't want to do, then I would encourage you to do hand expression antenatally so that if you're in a situation where baby is reluctant to latch um, or if baby for whatever reason needs more milk um, than what you have at that moment, then it's a really good um, thing to have. It also does take the pressure off as well. It, it, it does make you feel a little bit more confident thinking that you that you have it under your belt. If you are hand expressing and you're not getting any milk off, uh, colostrum off, sorry, colostrum pregnant, then that's okay too. So don't think that that is a sign that you're going to have um, problems uh, breastfeeding because you're not. Some women, some women's body, so when the placenta is born, your prolactin levels become higher and this is the hormone, another hormone um, that is needed for milk production. So some women just, some women's bodies are just waiting for that release of the pl placenta before it's, it kicks in and both ways are, are totally fine, they're totally normal. So if you are struggling to get colostrum off antenatally, um, then I would encourage you to keep going, keep trying a couple of minutes a day, um, right up until your baby is, is born. Uh, you may find that over time it, it does happen, but if it doesn't, I don't want you to think that you're not gonna have a successful breastfeeding journey. So hand expression then. Um, you firstly would want to uh, wash your hands um, and then massage your breast uh, tissue as well. You want to be in a relaxed situation for this. So, um, you know, feel, you want to feel chilled. If you're doing it in front of your partner and that makes you feel a bit weird, um, then just do it, you know, do it by yourself. But, you know, just whatever makes you feel more relaxed. So you massage round first. And then you want to find your your areola, which is the dark part of your nipple, and make a C. And around your areola, if you make a C and you push back, you'll feel little peas, like teeny tiny. They're probably not as big as peas, more like uh, couscous, <laughs> maybe. Um, you'll feel like little dots around your areola, and those are your milk ducts milk ducts and that is what you want to be um, putting a little bit of pressure on so this shouldn't be uncomfortable at all and as you push back so you're pushing towards your body and then squeezing in but you're not rubbing your skin so you're not squeezing the skin but you're just pushing back and then bringing your fingers together if that makes sense so you're not kind of squeezing your nipple and as you do that you may notice little droplets of colostrum coming out. So the colostrum can be clear, it can be orange, it can be yellow, that's all fine. So it doesn't mean that a brighter coloured one is more nutrition than a clear one. They are all of the same valued um, nutrition. With your oral syringe, so this, uh, the purple oral colostrum collecting syringes, you can ask your midwife uh, for a couple of these or you can buy them online and then you just want to be uh, collecting the little droplets. So this syringe here is a one mil syringe. So if you fill up that syringe, like that's incredible to fill up that syringe. Equally, it's really normal if you've got 0 0.1 mil. So all of those are totally normal um, amounts to get. So don't feel don't feel like you have to fill this syringe. Um, just do it for a couple of minutes. You can do it from um, 36 weeks and you just a couple of minutes a day. So you might want to do it a couple of minutes in the morning, uh, a couple of minutes in the evening, but you don't want to be doing it more than three times a day. Um, and within that day, if you wanted to use the same syringe, that's fine. So you can put your syringe in the fridge in between 
and then once the day's finished and you've done all of your collecting for that day you want to label your colostrum syringe with your surname ready for when you go to hospital and the date and time that you collected it as well so um and then it will be frozen and then when you go into hospital you will want to have like a, a you know the cool bags like a lunchbox cool bag with two ice packs in there and then you would get it out of your freezer put it in there if you can put it in a clear plastic bag uh, as well with one of your hospital stickers on if you have them in your notes um, and then it will go from your cool bag with your ice blocks uh, into the hospital and then it will go into the hospital's uh, freezer as well. Uh, it can stay in the fridge but then you would want to uh, use it uh, fairly quickly. So number five is a postnatal plan. So in pregnancy make a plan for what's going to happen postnatally. So we've spoke about things about um, skin to skin and uninterrupted time um, that can go on your birth preferences or your birth plan, but this is more for uh, what happens when you get home. So breastfeeding um, can take a lot of time. So, and, and, it's, and it's a lot of time on you as the breastfeeding mum as well. And this can mean, we, you know, we've spoke about feeding around the clock, we've spoke about cl cluster feeding. So you're getting a picture of how it can be like. So there are times, especially during those cluster feedings, where you feel like you're sat on the sofa um, for mo most of the evening. Um, and this may be that, that things that you previously did before, uh, you may not have the time to do it. So within your household and your responsibilities of, of what you're responsible for in your household and what you do most, you may want to re-divvy that up. So have a chat with your partner on things that you are currently doing um, and things that they can take over responsibility for. It will stop the... Um, it will, it will stop the conversations after when, you know, if the school uniform for your other child isn't washed and that's something that you normally do, if you have that conversation antelatedly and say, uh, are you all right to do the, the washing after when baby's, when baby's born, um, then it may kind of stop those um, dramas. Uh, and then on a bigger picture, so things like uh, cooking dinner, walking the dog, taking children to school, you again may want to divvy that up within your wider community so for example you could ask a friend um, if they would be happy to uh, take your child to school do the morning school runs for example you could ask uh, both sets of parents or grandparents or um, your siblings if they would be happy to drop a dinner around um, every day just leave it on the doorstep uh, a dinner um, that you can then just pop in the oven it's one thing then less that you have to think about when you're trying to navigate um, breastfeeding um, and a newborn baby and then also your recovery from birth as well um, and then you know things like walking the dog is, any, is anyone available to, to walk the dog so it's just taking that pressure off so having that postnatal plan ready uh, can be really beneficial and it's just again taking any stresses off you for when you've enough to think about. Um, another thing that I would recommend you do as part of this postnatal plan uh, is think about your support group. So whilst you're pregnant have a Google of what breastfeeding support groups are around you and go to them whilst you are pregnant. So it is so much easier going to a place that you've already been when you're with your baby. So if you go when you're pregnant, you'd meet the leader, you'd know where to park, you'd know where to go, um, you know, you'll be familiar with the place, you'll be familiar with if you've got to pay or, you know, what ca do you need cash? Is there cake? Is there tea? You know, all the things that you need to know, you feel so much more comfortable having been there already. And you may meet some other pregnant mums or mothers who are just a few weeks ahead of you who are maybe with their babies um, again to uh, to build that support group so find out where your local breastfeeding service is and go to it whilst you are pregnant so those were my five things 
to stack the odds in your favour for successful breastfeeding. So we had your birth and how that affects breastfeeding, including skin to skin and the golden hour. Number two was feeding on demand. And we talked about what is at day naught normal, so the first 24 hours compared to that after, and why your baby needs to feed around the clock. Number three was positioning. So remember things like not touching the baby's head and thinking about how you would drink a cup of milk. Straight line, no turning of the head and no hands on the back of your head as well. Number four was hand expression. So this is something that you might want to consider doing whilst you're pregnant. And then number five was building that postnatal plan ready for when your baby comes. The postnatal plan, I'm going to put a link because I have one ready made for you. So you are welcome to go through that link and download that postnatal plan. So the postnatal plan has come straight from the online baby course that I have. So um, I'm a midwife and I have brought other people involved um, in this course. There's a physiotherapist in there um, who talks about your vaginal recovery, your cesarean birth recovery. Uh, as well as things like your core muscles. Uh, there is a lady who talks about baby sleep. I talk uh, in much more detail on there about breastfeeding. I have a clinical uh, psychologist talking about your mental health after as well. Colic and reflux right up to, right up to weaning. Um, and also I go into detail about what happens for you um, in that immediate time after you have a baby uh, right up until the uh, all, all through the fourth trimester which is your postnatal first three months so that's on something that i have created called the baby chapter online course and there is also a course that i've created um including um hypnobirthing and antenatal education and that is called the birth chapter online course as well so those are the two online courses that i have the postnatal plan uh, is through this link that I'm going to send uh, to the lovely people at The Baby Show uh, and they will hopefully share that link with you uh, for you to download uh, the postnatal plan. But I hope you found um, that helpful. My name is Beth, I'm from The Bump to Baby Chapter and you can find me on Instagram at The Bump to Baby Chapter and my website is www.thebumptobabychapter.co.uk Okay, thanks so much, bye!